Planetarium, our review. Planetarium plays up to four people. It's kind of a Euro game. The whole point is basically to complete contracts. In order to do that, you have to have the resources to complete the contracts. For instance, here you would need two clouds, a stone and water, and you'll get eight points and you'll be able to affect whether this planet is hostile or hostile, excuse me, or habitable. In order to get those resources, you will be colliding elements into planets or vice versa. So for instance, you could slide a planet all the way over here. You'd be able to take this and place it on its corresponding spot on your board. And to complete the actual contract, you'll need to be able to match the actual planet, gas giants and terrestrial. So there's some you know, requirements. So it's pretty balanced, I think, between luck uh, because you have cards that you'll be drawing to get tell you what contracts you have and the, the initial layout of the board. Yeah, I mean, there's the randomization of the initial elements as they're spread around the, the galaxy for you to fly into, but there's a lot of mitigation because, because there's the main orbital lines, but also these inner outer orbital lines, there's lots of ways for you to set yourself up to be able to get the element that you need, regardless of other player interaction, or you may have to take a different path uh, but there's lots of ways to put yourself in the best position to get what you need. And the game will run till about this point on the board. You Once you reach there, it accelerates how quickly the elements can move. Normally they can only move one space, but once you reach about the halfway point, they're able to go further. So um, I like that mechanism, the timing of as you're completing contracts, you're putting the resources that were spent onto this track, which will dictate the end of the game. So there's good timing elements to it to maximize your scoring and hopefully, you know, for yeah, your there's, opponents. Yeah, there's not going to be a lot of downtime at the end. You know, as you can see with our final sort of setup here, there's a lot of resources here. Well, if one per turn movement for resources, like to get out of these orbits and way out here to one of these larger planets that's on a long, that's right. a lot of turns of moving just one space at a time. So this sort of acceleration helps um, keep the end of the game, you know, moving quicker and quicker uh, as you get those final few cards scored. Another aspect of the game are these final evolution cards. Uh, you start the game with one and they're basically end of game contracts that give you larger uh, contract totals usually than say some of the other ones. You also have the choice as the game goes on to choose low level contracts which are easier to complete with lower victory points and then higher evolution ones which will give you better points but they require uh, more elements and other aspects to line up for you to be able to get them. Yeah, and both the low and the high evolution cards also impact the hostility of the planet. So as you're working towards an end game goal, you know, it may be in your best interest to try to build up a bunch of low ones so that you're quickly changing the hostility level on the planet to be what you need it for an end game scoring. There's sort of that, that roll together uh, scoring for it. Right, so what, that, what he's referring to is, see, this is one of the final evolution cards. You need to have these elements on a habitable planet in the orbit of three to five. And you had to have completed a contract on uh, a type of planet that you had, the planet that you actually have letter. So for instance, let's say it was D, I would have had to have completed a contract on D to be able to pull those elements off at the end of the game to do this. So that's 12 points and that's great, but... There's lots of steps to get to those 12 points. And some of them might not be in your own control, especially the ones that have the planets lining up in a particular orbit, or whether a planet may or may not be hostile or habitable. That is dictated by the cards that were played. Um, some of the cards, for instance, this planet, has 16 habitable and seven um, hazard. So it is then, because this is greater than that, 
it will stay that side up. But if another player plays a card to that, completes a contract, that would make this number go up so that it's greater than 16, it would flip. Yeah, it is it is the only sort of player manipulation that could be... I could have a pursuit that I am trying to go for that may be counter to yours. Um, that's the only sort of direct interaction between players is just... I may want a planet to be on one side and you may want it to be on the other for some sort of final scoring situation. Well, the other thing that might affect um, another player is I can look at your board and see that you've got a bunch of elements on D. Sure. And I might be thinking you're setting up for the final evolution and maybe D needs to be in a particular orbit. Yeah. So I might want to get it, it move it from where it is just assuming it's sitting in a place maybe where you would like it. True, but that would, it's possible to do that, but I also think there's so many options for how you need the final scoring parts to go. Some of them do require very specific orbits, but some of them require, you know, the ones that have more materials as part of the requirement tend to not require an orbital height or vice versa, you know, so it, it would be very difficult to predict exactly what the goal is for someone else on a planet um, and try to do something intentionally to sort of undermine that. It would be almost as much luck of running a planet somewhere that it's not supposed to be. Right. I don't think the player interaction is the highest thing here. No. I mean, you're competing for resources, and it kind of sucks when another player moves a planet into a resource that you wanted. Um, but again, they probably don't have any idea that they're interfering with yeah. you. They just need that resource. Yeah, and, and again, there's lots of other options. You know, if if someone runs it in from here down into this orbit to get this dirt, well, they're still from this position. You could take this one and run it into it, or you could run it into the next one coming up. Like, there's lots of... Because or, the resources are fairly well distributed. Go into that one. Yeah, there's, there's lots of ways for you to set yourself up for multiple paths, especially in a two-player game, which we're playing right now. You know, if I move a planet to a position where there's two options ahead of it that are both useful for me, then if you take one, I still have a way to sort of reroute another resource into it. Yeah, I mean, I think overall the design of this game is it's a pleasant play. Yeah, it's I mean it's relatively simple, it's relatively easy to learn. Your your actions are fairly limited as far as you're moving one planet either until it hits something or an item one space usually into a planet, always going clockwise. The cards are, you know, there's a little bit of, of symbols that you're having to, to learn, but not massively. You're trying to match the resources or get it onto a certain type of planet, the, you know, the terrestrial or the gas ones. Um, there's a slight race, but at the same time, um, you know, getting there quickly doesn't matter if you're scoring a bunch of low contracts right, and yeah. don't have any final cards. I really quickly, in the game that we played just now, really quickly got this first contract out, well, that was great, but it was only two points. You know, that's not a huge lead for me. Having a card out on the board isn't necessarily some sort of great advantage, other than the fact that I get to now draw and start working towards other challenges. That's right. Um, I do think there's, uh, you know, the tension ramps up slightly towards the end because you're hoping that you have that one contract you'd really like to complete, and you're afraid that another player will get there before you, but gosh, you still need one more resource. Will it make it back to your turn right. before the game ends? Yeah. I and, like that. And especially with, with the contracts, the final evolutions where you need them to be in certain depths, it's very easy to like have guided it down into a position, you know, you need it to get into that one to three range. And then all of a sudden, because of a resource need of the other player, it's, it's right. jumping out of your ring. Like it, it's, it's, those are tough ones to get sometimes. I agree. Well, overall, I think this is a great game. I love to play it. I think the components are nice. They're, um, the board is the perfect size. These tokens, you know, it, there's never really a doubt what you're looking at. The colors are all different enough. Um, I mean, I want to eat the scoring markers every they time I play. Delicious. They look, yeah, they do look delicious. And I really don't have any complaints about the game. For what it is, it runs less than an hour. I think it plays well at all player counts, really. Um, Partially because it plays so quickly. Yeah. Because you only have the one action per turn, it does. It plays really quickly. Also, the artwork, especially on the cards, is is pretty spectacular. Like the the planets that you're getting to see on all of the cards, they're all unique. Yeah, it's it's not so cookie cutter. You know, half of the cards are this one image, and the other half are this other thing. Every single one seems to be. Um, 
a cool, unique image with a little science factoid on the bottom. Um, yeah. You yeah, it's, just, it's a good looking game. Definitely a lot of love went into the design, I think. Uh, and it plays in an hour or less. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's just a pleasant experience, and it's a game that I think, you know, I can teach this to most people. Mm -hmm. And af by the time they play it the second time, for sure, they should be totally on board with the mechanics and be thinking about more advanced strategies. Yeah, Although it's... they might still win it the first time around. Yeah, it's certainly easy enough to teach. And I, I don't think it would be that difficult to even start thinking ahead. I'm sure by somebody's first or second playthrough, they can start putting together the pieces of, oh, you know, this is how I need to be thinking about how the planets are moving or, you know, what cards are the most valuable. Right, and, yeah. and are you going to draw, when, when is the cutoff for you to draw a high evolution right. card, hoping you can get it, for, you know, the points, but knowing you're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, no, I really like it. I think on a scale from one to great, I would put this at very solid game. I agree. It's, you know, it's nice and simple. It plays easy. It, it's it's a chill game. It really is. There's Planetarium. I'd say check it out if you haven't. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe.